Go. Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Warhammer 40k lore. Where today we're gonna have a look at Tyranid bioweaponry. More specifically, the ranged type of bioweaponry. For whilst, of course, the Tyranids, being a race of enormous monster space insects, have plentiful access to melee weapons, most of them are, well, limb basically. So we're gonna focus on the more weapony, weapony bits. You know, the little symbiotic animals that fire flesh-eating beetles from their buttholes. <laughs> Which, by the way, is a damned intriguing evolutionary path to choose for the hive mind right there. Seeing as, back in the day, the Tyranids were not actually bonded to their weapons. You can see here the old school Nids, their insectoid inspiration along with... <laughs> cough. Cough aliens. Cough. Cough. Other sources of inspiration was already apparent. But the main deviation, as you can see here, was that the old school Tyranids used to wield their weapons. They carried them and wielded them in their hands, so, well, the claws, anyways, and the guns themselves were their own unique life forms, like super low intelligence animals, essentially. And I always thought that was a really cool idea. This alien horde consisting of dozens if not hundreds of varying creatures, all symbiotically working together in beautiful harmony to wipe out and devour all life from the galaxy. <laughs> Meanwhile, the modern day Tyranids, the weapon is essentially a modification on the basic Tyranid life form. A flesh borer, for example, cannot be separated from the termagant, unless you apply a sharp object, that is, and the termagant cannot simply drop the flesh borer, as they are one and the same creature. And speaking of the flesh borer, it's as good a place to start as any, isn't it? Since beyond claws and teeth, it is probably the most prolific of all Tyranid bioweaponry. The flesh borer is employed, uh, both literally and figuratively, I suppose, Primarily by termagants and gargoyles, both of whom are smaller vanguard organisms of the larger Tyranid invasion force. And much like their host organisms, the termagants and the gargoyles, the Flesh Border 2 is designed to overwhelm the enemy's defences via numbers and speed. As the Flesh Border is possessed both of an extravagantly sized womb, and a high rate of flatulence. No, no, I'm, I'm correct in describing it this way. Think about it. It doesn't have a magazine. It has a breeding chamber filled with lava in various stage of development. It's not a magazine. And there certainly is no firing process involved in the flesh border. There's no chemical reaction creating an explosion that propels the flesh eating beetle out of the sphincter. And once we're on this topic, you don't reload a flesh borer, you impregnate it, obviously. Mm, hold on, wouldn't that mean that the hole that the babies come out of is the... Ooh. Right, you know what, on second thought, let's return to more traditional terminology, shall we? Because frankly, discussing the impregnation of handheld weaponry and the process through which the babies are then fired at the enemy, albeit hilarious, <laughs> might get me flagged for many, many different reasons, some of which are expressly erotic in nature. So, Rejecting modernity and embracing tradition, the flesh borer does indeed have a high rate of fire, though its ammunition is somewhat unique as it fires these adorable little children. This is a flesh-eating beetle. I would like you to pay particular attention to the tiny little hat it is wearing, which will reduce its chance of dying upon impact. <laughs> Not not eliminate, not remove, not mitigate, reduce. <laughs> and to be fair, that is an important distinction to make. Incidentally, this is also one of the reasons why the flesh border needs such a high rate of fire. 
because when a significant portion of your ammunition is likely to contract severe to lethal head trauma from the higher velocity impacts, <laughs> you've got to mitigate the dead loss in some way. But, obvious weakness of the fragile munition aside, when the beetle manages to not brain itself upon impact, it is exceptionally lethal. As the ammunition, well, first and foremost, I'd imagine it would actually deliver a fair bit of a kinetic impact to begin with. But the real danger is, of course, that it is a tiny, flesh-eating monster beetle which will immediately begin chewing, clawing, scratching, and stabbing its way through anything that it hits. Even armor. Now, judging by the size of the thing, I doubt it's going to be gnawing its way through power armor anytime soon, but a flak jacket or something like that? Well, even if it can't get through the plate immediately in front of it, there's every possibility the little bastard will simply go around it. <laughs> Smart munitions. <laughs> well... Smart, quote-unquote. They don't live long, however. Within just a handful of seconds, the flesh borer's beetle will expire. But a handful of seconds of a tiny little fragmentation grenade chewing its way through your body is probably already pretty damn dangerous. At the very least, you are going to be suffering from some ridiculously severe lacerations. And that's just thinking about one of them. Now, how exactly does all of this work, though? Obviously, the beetles themselves are tiny little living beings. They must be able to exist within the gun somehow, and if they die within seconds of impact, they must be in some kind of suspended animation within the weapon. And yes, that is exactly what happens. Now, there is a little bit of a divergence here, with some sources indicating that the flesh border, the weapon itself, actually gives birth to the beetles, or at the very least, fertilizes and incubates the eggs, or whatever the beetles come from, and then store them inside of the flesh borer's, uh, body, I suppose? Where the beetles are kept in a state of suspended animation, with all of their biological functions kept at an absolute minimum. The other idea is that the flesh borer beetles, their lava, their eggs, or whatever, are actually produced separately and then literally loaded into the flesh borer, whose only duty after that is sustaining them for long enough to actually fire them. Personally, I do prefer the first one, because the idea of a weapon capable of replenishing its own ammunition supply via feeding off the host body's nourishment is a really goddamn cool one. And seeing as the flesh border is already directly attached to the termagant and gargoyle, and takes whatever extra sustenance it requires from the host body to keep the little flesh border beetles alive, as they are in suspended animation, they still do require some energy to remain alive, after all. It makes a lot of sense for this weapon to be able to replenish its own ammo, particularly considering that, again, they're supposed to be overwhelming weapons. If they are unable to replenish their own ammunition, and the Tyranids don't really have much of a supply train, it would mean that Termigants and Gargoyles would only be effective for one, maybe two engagements, after which they'd be completely useless. A bit of a tactical flaw there, one would think. Anywho, regardless of the method, uh, once the little flesh border beetles are inside of the weapon, they are, as mentioned, kept in a state of suspended animation. Whatever nourishment they do require is fed into them directly by the weapon, which uses its own storages of energy or the host's stores of energy. Once the host body is heading into battle, one of the beetles is loaded into the... Battle? Sphincter? Vagoo? whatever you like to call it, where it is then kept as a ready bullet in the barrel. Once the host organism is then finally ready to fire the weapon, it initiates a two-stage process. Firstly, the firing chamber is filled with electrical energy via a chemical reaction. This activates the beetle and sends it into a manic frenzy. And then, within milliseconds, so as to ensure that the creature doesn't start eating its way through the barrel, it is fired out of the flesh borer. Which in turn, of course, leads to the very grisly death of either the target or the beetle.
And frankly, the Great Devourer does not care one iota which one it is. It's all biomatter in the end. And there's plenty more little beetles where that one came from. And speaking of beetles, there is a another Tyranid weapon as well that many speculate is closely related. <laughs> I do suppose relations is the literal term is supposed to be using here to the flesh border. And it is, of course, the devourer. Though this one is a little bit different and quite interesting because we know for sure that this is a living organism that exists alongside its munition. In some way, the devourer itself is the hive, the home, or potentially even the breeding pit for the flesh worms, or the even more highly evolved brain leech worms. But regardless of the type of baby it fires, the devourer functions more or less the same. It is a large organism that is attached, much like the flesh border, directly to the host organism, which in this case tends to be the much larger warrior variants. The devourer then takes all of the nourishment it requires to feed, incubate, and raise its thousands upon thousands upon thousands of worms from the host organism. I would imagine this would place a pretty damn hefty strain on the warrior's body, but, well, Tyranid organisms are meant to be short-lived, and if the Hive fleet ever feels that it requires more longevity from its warrior organisms, I'm sure it could just slap on some extra fatty sacks somewhere to increase survivability, or well, feed ability more correctly. The Devourer then actually hosts and raises these thousands upon thousands of little worms, be they the flesh or the brain leech variant. It stores them, keeps them happy and fat, and when the warrior enters into battle, it lures nice big juicy gaggles of these critters into the fire tubes using a pheromone signal. Once the warrior then actually fires the weapon, it is the same process like a flesh border, but on a much larger scale, with multiple firing tubes all receiving the same synapse signal to evict their occupants at high speed. Unlike the border beetles, however, the flesh worms and the brain leeches are a little bit more long-term critters. They can survive for a considerable period outside of the Devourer, and they have been specifically bioengineered to seek out nerve tissue. <laughs> now that is a goddamn nasty weapon. Kind of like, well, nerve gas, except it's a flesh-eating worm creature chewing its way through your spinal cord. Or, in the case of the brain leech worm, <laughs> I'll give you two guesses as to where that one is heading. Oh, God. <laughs> you know what? Getting murdered by the claws is suddenly seeming like a much, much, much more appealing prospect. The little worms also do have just a tiny little bit of anti-armor capabilities as well. I believe I forgot to mention this with the flesh borders beetles, but both the beetles and the worms are also coated in, well, corrosive acids, or they secrete them from their paws or their mouths. Regardless, they're covered in acid, and they're soon going to make sure that you are covered in acid as well. So that even if the horde of little worms pitter-patter harmlessly off the armor of the enemy, it's going to be a lot weaker for the next blast of worms. Oh, and of course, if a few hundred acid-covered aberrations is not enough, the Devourer also comes in a twin-linked variety. <laughs> Because, of course, it does. But we keep running into the problem of armor, don't we? Because, at the end of the day, no matter how pugnacious a beetle or a worm might be, it's gonna have a hard time chewing its way through steel. Hmm. I'm sure there's a turned weapon somewhere that can deal with this at least a little bit better. Well, there is. Um, let me introduce you to the Venom Cannon. Now, I'm old enough to remember when the Venom Cannon was an anti-infantry weapon. 
And I suppose, to an extent, it still is today. It sure as hell is a hell of a lot more effective against medium to heavy infantry than it is against heavy armor, but such is the curse of the Tedanid player, isn't it? But think about it too. Doesn't it make way more sense for the Venom Cannon to be a dedicated anti-infantry weapon rather than a dedicated anti-vehicle weapon? Oh, well, as dedicated as the Tedanid army ever gets to anti-vehicle, I do suppose. Because it fires, in stark contrast to the Devourer or the Flesh Border, a non-living projectile. No enormous worms or beetles here. Instead, it fires a huge shard of solidified corrosive poison. Now that's a weapon right there, and imagine the effect it would have on an infantry squad. You've got a big, a brittle crystal, which upon impact will instantaneously shatter into tens of thousands of flying razor-sharp needles, embedding themselves in anything and everything they hit. Best case scenario, you've got a piece of corrosive acid eating its way through your armor. Worst case scenario, you've got one of these slivers embedded inside of you as it begins to melt. Oh, much, much bubbly flesh. Meanwhile, its anti-armor performance is, um, well, it's something, certainly. At the end of the day, it is an enormous crystal the size of a grown man's skull striking the side of an armored vehicle, and it is also made out of a highly corrosive acid. The impact in and of itself is likely to be considerable. And then, the side of your tank is coated in corrosive poison, slowly eating its way through the hull and dripping into the fighting compartment. I can absolutely see this causing a great deal of inconvenience, both for the vehicle and the crew, but it really does lack that initial knockout punch, doesn't it? It's always the weakness with using little fleshy bits to penetrate armor, I do suppose. So let us instead return to what the Tyranids actually do well, with a literal penis. No? No, 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 it, it's a penis. It is an actual, genuine, honest-to-God penis. Now, many of the Tyranid weapons are certainly somewhat phallic in nature, but this thing, well, its ammunition storage is a ball sack, which contains seed, which is then pumped out into the air via a musculated tube. It's a peepee, -pee, and don't you argue it. However, that does not mean that the Barbed Strangler isn't useful. In fact, it used to be one of my favorite weapon upgrades back in Dawn of War 2 during the absolute glory days of the Tyranid Menace. Oh, God, what bullshit. <laughs> In 1v1, the Tyranids merely had an overwhelming advantage. In 2v2, they were almost unbeatable, but in 3v3, there is no way to beat triple Tyranids. One player would build Ripper Swarms, and he would cap and decap every point on the map. And since Ripper Swarms were immune to suppression, took diddly dick damage even from grenades and high explosives, and cost nothing to replenish, you could move up in front of an enemy player's entire army, decap a victory point, and then simply just leave, and be back with another Ripper Squad before he'd even finished capping it back again. It would completely deadlock the game. Meanwhile, the second player would go for the Lictor with free reinforcements of Termagants and Hormigants, and simply build an enormous death blob of Hormigants and just walk into the enemy's fire. They're suppressed? <laughs> so what? I can replenish all of them for free with the Pheromone Trail. You can kill half of them, the other half, and then all of them will still reach your lines eventually, son. And the third player would go for nothing but mass warrior spam. That would be your early game mailed fist, whilst the Ripper player transitioned into Carnifexes. And since he had spent almost no power whilst also building all of the power, allowing the other two players to really get their spam on, you would get Carnifexes at a time when the enemy would be struggling to have even one anti-tank weapon on the field, particularly as they'd also faced off against an unstoppable horde of Hormigans and Warriors as well. 
By the time you have all three Tyranid Khan effects out, the other players are also beginning to get Khan effects. Oh, Christ. What would you do? The first one would get a Venom Cannon, just to brush aside anything the enemy might have brought out early on. That was also partially the responsibility of the Warrior player to pop out a Venom Cannon here or there to deal with any super rushy armor from the enemy. But by and large, by the time they had out something like a Dreadnought, you'd have two, maybe three Carnifexes. And the second one, the Barbed Strangler. That was the piece de resistance. After that, the enemy was boned, because all of their infantry would be instantaneously suppressed by one single massive AoE shot by the Barbed Strangler, after which hordes of Hormigans or warriors would butcher entire armies in milliseconds. Oh, Jesus. It was unbelievably unfair. Unfathomably so. It makes even the cheese of using the Tyranid spore mines on the enemy's retreat points feel <laughs> almost fair and balanced. But, I have deviated somewhat from the original topic, the barbed penis fires, you see, seeds of alien flora, in, in, in a sort anyways, that are originally stored in the ball sack. Much like the beetles mentioned in the flesh borders, these are kept in a suspended state of animation, making sure that they won't go crazy whilst within the nutsack of its daddy weapon. Once the weapon is ready to be fired, one of the seeds is transported into the shaft and is given a brief period of muscular stimulation before finally being shot out of the barrel in an ejaculatory fashion. Once leaving the barrel, the seed grows fully active and starts sprouting tendrils, actual slicing, hogging tentacles all out of the seed. This creates a well, trapped minefield, practically, where they can cover a huge area in barbed strangling flora. It does an absolute number on enemy infantry. Oh, God does it, since it creates basically an area of sentient razor wire. Nasty. Extraordinarily nasty. And... As if that wasn't enough, because of course it wasn't, the seed quickly dies after having shot out all of its tendrils and bound up everything it can reach. But this does not make it more fragile, no, on the contrary. The seed doesn't expire via running out of energy like the flesh border beetles, for example. Instead, the last burst of life energy is spent making all of the tendrils as rigid and solid as steel cables. Oh yeah, if you're hit by this and you somehow survive being bound by barbed wire, you're not going to be moving anytime soon either, as you undoubtedly are slowly strangled or bled to death by all of the razor-cutting tendrils embedded in your flesh. Best case scenario, you will have just enough time left amongst the living to see the hordes of hormigons swarming towards you looking for an easy snack. I gotta say, I am very fond of whoever came up with the Tyranid weaponry because, oh, it is awful, isn't it? It is really genuinely quite terrifying. And on the topic of awful ways to die, let's wrap it up with the Death Spitter. I do love this one, but honestly, I love the old description of it way more than the modern one. Because you see, uh, back in the day, when the Death Spitter was a separate entity to the warrior, it was its own little lovely creature. It had a <clears throat> reading chamber where it stored all of the happy little lava and pumped them full of highly corrosive and explosive gases. Because of course it would. That's, that's what you do with lava, you pump them full of things that explode and scatter burning poison everywhere. 
Then, when the Tyranid warrior wanted the weapon to actually do its job and inflict pain and suffering upon the enemy, one unlucky little larva would be picked out of the cosy little breeding chamber and placed before a spider monster creature thing, which would strip away all of his protective carapaces one by one, ripping them away from the larva's soft, liquidy body, screaming all the way, I'm certain. After which, the now naked larva would be placed within the firing tube, and I imagine very gently and gingerly spat out of it, while still retaining as much velocity as possible without shattering the now highly fragile creature. The larva, still undoubtedly screaming its tiny little lungs off, would then be flung through the air before impacting upon the enemy, splashing, dying, still screaming in all your likelihood, and scattering vast globulates of burning explosive blood poison everywhere. I believe this might just be the only weapon in science fiction history that has made me feel worse for the ammunition than for the person getting hit by it. Imagine you are just having a fat and happy little life as a bug inside of a snug little compartment. You're being fed things that taste rather spicy but are still very fulfilling every day. And then uh, the hand of God reaches down into your world, grasps you from it, places you in front of a creature whose only purpose in life is tearing your protective layers apart, leaving you soft vulnerable and in pain before evicting you from the only home you've ever known and sending you flying out into the world in abject misery and suffering for the remaining three seconds of your life. It is the saddest little turnit creature. Hey, the flesh border beetle, it's just in a blind rage, it doesn't know what's going on. The worms, they get to eat their favourite food before dying. The seed pods are it's bloody seed pods, they don't know anything. And the crystal is, well, it's, it's a dumb rock. It has no concept of what's going on. But this poor little wobbly bobbly pile of fluffy splashiness, it's innocent. It hasn't harmed anyone. It doesn't want to kill anyone. It is just being used mercilessly as a hand grenade by an evil, vile, and bigoted alien species. Truly, life is suffering. And to yet further illustrate that point, I will end this lore video right here. Until next time, I have been Arch, thank you very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Do consider leaving a like and a comment in the comment section down below to help with the algorithmic gods. And until next time, have a day that is markedly better than Tedanid ammunition.